thank you. Uh, we need to start with the Hail Mary asking Our Lady to help us uh, and to, to help us understand and give us perspective. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Blessed Jacinta and Francesco, pray for us. Sister Lucy, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Uh, what I've discovered in working on this message of Fatima for 35 years is that there are always new things to discover. There are not many words of Our Lady altogether, all but the more we think about them, the more they tell us how unique this event is and what, what unique times that we ourselves are living in and that Fatima is the answer to the problems both of mankind and of the Church. I realize that people, um, some people like to think that we're exaggerating or that we're too simplistic. So we should first of all try and get ourselves a context. Uh, try to, um, if you look at a, f a picture and you put your nose on the picture, you can't really see everything about it because you're too close. So it's important for us to sort of stand back from the picture in order to get what the picture is about. And I think we have to do the same with regard to Fatima. Fatima is about our time, and because we're so close to events in our time, and we are so distracted besides, we don't always get this perspective. Let us first of all either point out that the miracle itself, seen by 70,000 people, was announced three months ahead of time. As far as I know, no miracle has ever been announced by God three months ahead of time to challenge anyone who wanted to, to see that there would be a miracle that all could believe. And we do have 70,000 people who went there. We have people who were believers, people who were devoted. We also have people who were non-believers. We have people who were actually opponents. As I say, the captain of the guard that was called out to stop the people from coming himself converted and, of course, let the pilgrims come. The magnitude of this miracle then and its timing are unprecedented. The fact that 70,000 people witnessed it, that's as many people that lived in Jerusalem at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. The Pharisees asked for a sign. Work for us, they said to him, a sign in the heavens and we will believe you. Jesus refused to give them that sign. He obviously could have had he wanted to but he didn't want to. But the very sign that the Pharisees asked for, a sign in the heavens, is a sign that our generation has been given for everyone to see. Up until that time, it's never happened. And it's never happened since either, except privately for someone like Pope Paul Pius XII, but it wasn't seen by everybody else. But this miracle, 70,000 people saw. It wasn't just what they saw. It was also the miraculous drying of the muddy ground and their clothes instantly. It wasn't just those impossible things by scientific, by scientific fact. There's also many cures at the same time. And of course, as St. Augustine tells us, the conversion of many sinners was the biggest miracle of all. And these signs were given for one reason, which is to authenticate, to make us realize that this message indeed comes from God, that it's not just someone's imagination, that God intends to be taken seriously. And seeing the age that it was so unbelieving even then, God gave a greater sign so that people could not ignore it. Besides the miracle of the sun seen by 70,000 people, you have the great sign. Our Lady said, when you see the great sign, she called it herself a great sign. It's the same phrase that is used in Sacred Scripture, chapter 12, verse 1. A great sign was seen in the heavens. 
What Ali referred to, the great sign to be seen in the heavens, was seen on January 25, 1938. Not seen just by 70,000 people, but by millions and millions of people all over Europe and parts of North America as well. This was so striking, so visible. As I say, the priest in, uh, one of the uh, priests in the seminary in Austria in Vienna told me that he was there that night and the priests usually had exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. That night they did not do that because they thought all the priests would be called out for confessions for to, um, to give the last sacraments to somebody who was in this great fire that seemed to be on the other side of town. This, the, the light was that bright and they only could imagine at first that it was a great fire somewhere in the city. This is the first time that God has warned humanity of its partial destruction in such a public way. Not since biblical times has this warning been given to mankind from God himself. When she says, if my requests are not granted, various nations will be annihilated. I understand that people find this hard to hear, they don't want to repeat it, but that's not the worst of it. Lucy had no problem writing down this part of the secret, unlike what she had the problem of writing down the third secret. When she wrote down the second secret, we have no record of her hesitating or having to have more time Whereas when she was commanded to write down the third secret, she was very obedient. She took her pen, she went to her room, she took her pad of paper, and for all the month of October, when she had this formal order, all the month of November and all the month of December 1943, she could not write it down for the terror that putting it on paper caused her. It was only after the Blessed Virgin appeared to her on the 2nd of January, 1944, that she was able to write down the secret. I'm not talking about that document that was given by the Vatican in 2000. That was the easy part to write. The part that we haven't got is the one that's harder to. This divine warning was given in 1917 and yet was scheduled only to be given to us in 1960. We see then the delivery of this message is unfolding. Why should we not have this message back in 1917? Why should we not have it until 1960? There's a reason for this. And the reason is that people would not understand if they heard the secret in 1917, but they would understand it in 1960. It would be, as Sister Lucy says, clearer then. The message is unfolded gradually because Fatima is unique. It is Our Lady's, uh, shall we say, final stage in her battle against the devil. The devil thinks, and from what we see around us every day, the devil appears to have got the upper hand and he thinks he's going to win. Our Lady told Lucy that the devil is in the mood for the final battle, and he thinks he's going to win. We are in the final battle, but we are assured that in the end, Our Lady will win. She uses this term, triumph. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. We are in a battle, it doesn't look like it, it's not as dramatic in some ways as the battle, if you go on a battlefield, whether you know history of warfare or battles, there are some dramatic moments. These moments are not seen in this battle. And therefore, most of the people don't are asleep. But we are in this battle which is raging all around us. It is killing people. More importantly, it is killing souls. 
And this battle uh, is real. The battle being fought against us today is following the doctrine of Sun Tzu, the Chinese military strategist. He's a brilliant mind of 2,500 years ago. And he says the best battle to win is a battle in which your enemy doesn't even know that he's under attack. And that when he, when he finally is openly attacked, he doesn't know what hit him. And he describes this battle as being as if there are eggs at the bottom of a hill and you roll these, the boulders down the hill and you squ squash all the eggs. This is the battle we're in and we are the eggs. The devil's been so good at um, changing our perception of things that that is why Our Lady appears and works such a great miracle. Most of you, for example, in Europe, remember a time when the euro did not exist. This piece of paper that everyone accepts today at the stores about 14 years ago did not exist. And people bought things with their own currencies. Now that is what I would call a paradigm. That is, people have the understanding, because everyone else has the understanding, that if you present this paper at the store, you will get food or you will get other things that you want. But a time will come when scripture tells us that you won't be able to do that anymore. That you will only be able to buy or sell if you have the mark of the beast, of the devil, on your hand or your forehead. Now, when St. John wrote that back in 2000 years ago, or, 2000, or 1900 years ago at, in Patmos, it was inconceivable how this would happen. Today, of course, it's very conceivable that if they put a chip in your hand, that they can swipe that chip and take something out of your bank account, and the only way you can pay for things is with that chip being swiped. That is doable, it is being done already today. At some point, it will be imposed by quote unquote law. And if you don't get the mark of the beast, you will not be able to buy or sell. Now this, this will be a paradigm shift. It may happen, I'm told that, that uh, the rulers of the world, I'm not talking now about the governments of the world, they're not the rulers of the world, that the rulers of the world have decided to change our currency possibly this year. And people will then learn, just like they learned to use the euro 15 years ago or 10 years ago, somewhere not so long ago, they will learn to, to use this new currency. This is what Our Lady has come to tell us that we've entered into this apocalyptic age. Of course, when we say this today, it sounds like we're just being sensational. Our Lord himself tells us that the times of the apocalypse would be, there would be signs in the sun and the moon. Well, we've had the sign in the sun. So the message of Fatima is unfolding gradually to the extent that our minds are capable of understanding it. People have difficulty uh, with the message when it says that the apostasy in the church begins at the top. That the message tells us that in the secret. Obviously, when we say this, it is hard to understand how can this be. In fact, Cardinal Bertoni himself on television, I watched his whole show on Porta Porta, and when he was asked the question, if there is an, a, another document that talks, the Blessed Virgin talks of a betrayal by people in the Vatican or in the upper hierarchy, is that message, could that be the part of the message? Some people say it is. And Cardinal Bertoni, having a paradigm that is a model in his mind, 
which is incorrect. Just like you have the model in your mind today that you'll be able to buy things with your euro forever, but that model is incorrect. It's good for now, it works now, but it won't work for the future. Similarly with this model we have that everyone who speaks from the Vatican is to be obeyed, is to be believed. And therefore, Cardinal Bertoni says, how could the Mother, Blessed Virgin possibly say such a thing? She's the help of Christians. Therefore, she would not say such a thing because you see, Cardinal Bertoni has in his mind a model or a paradigm, as it's called, in which everything has to fit into that paradigm. But it doesn't have to fit in that paradigm. We use these models in our mind in order to get on with our work and our life every day. And yes, use your 20 euro note if you need to buy something, but remember it's only a paradigm, it's only a model for functioning right now. But when God tells us that a time will come when you won't be able to use that, that you'll have to be disloyal to God if you want to buy anything, you'll have to make a choice. This is why this miracle is so unique, why the message is so unique, and why it takes time to unfold. It's unfortunate that the 5,000 and more documents that we have on Fatima have yet to be published. It's unfortunate that the secret that we've been told is there, we know is there, has not been given. The reason given, again, by um, Mr. Uh, Giuseppe Di Carli and by Cardinal Bertoni himself on radio on April 30th last year, he did say there's more to the secret to unfold. He said that quite obviously and directly on radio. I listened to him, I recognize his voice, I listened to it myself. But he then said we should not be catastrophists. I agree, we shouldn't be catastrophists. But we will have a catastrophe if we don't listen to Our Lady in time. But you see, the secret talks about this catastrophe for not obedience. So there are two, two ways to go about this. One is to keep everyone calm and not get anyone excited. And people go along thinking everything is fine. Whereas there will be a catastrophe if we maintain that course. Now, do I disagree with Cardinal Bertoni in, in his assessment of things? Of course I do. Am I being disloyal or unfaithful to either the Pope or Cardinal Bertoni for doing so? Not at all. The difference between myself and Cardinal Bertoni is I've had more time to think about this message than he has. You see, they would like to think because the message is so upsetting, because it is so mind-boggling that it's something the imagination of some poor peasant woman who couldn't even read or write. I explained in public here at this hotel two years ago to Mr. Ducardi that she wasn't that dumb, that she, could, she didn't learn to read when she was 35 years old. She was writing and reading before she was 15. And the documents we have in her own handwriting prove that. But almost any excuse is used because Fatima is so disconcerting. That is why we have to understand why this message is given gradually. Our Lady says in 1917, I will come back to ask for the communions of reparation on the first Saturdays. And she did come back in 1925. I will come back to ask for the consecration of Russia. She did come back in June 13, 1929. She said then, before then, people could not understand the depth of evil that the Soviet regime was and what it's built upon. In 1917, the Orthodox clergy had 50,000 priests. By 1929, they had 500 priests. 49,500 were wiped out by the Soviet regime. The 500 that were left made a deal with Stalin to adapt the message of the gospel to the communist message. That was the deal which saved their physical lives. And this adoption 
was enforced. There's never been a time, even in the all of history, even when in the lay uh, investiture debates between the civil authorities and the church authorities, there's never been a time that 95% of the clergy was wiped out by the ruling king. Just as our age is quite different from any other age, our age, there's never been a time that one-seventh of the world's population has been killed by their fellow man. And yet we have one billion, 686 million people who were killed by their own governments or by war and by abortion. That represents more than 14%, more like closer to 20% of mankind. And yet, because it's not in the front pages of the newspaper, we don't pay attention. We were much better off paying attention to what God is trying to bring to our attention instead of wasting our time watching the news from the main media that basically are in the pocket of the money that pays them and distracting them, we'd be much better off recognizing the signs of our time. We see even that this sign of our time was ignored at the Second Vatican Council. And while it talked about the signs of the time, the greatest sign that God gave us, the miracle of the sun and the great sign of 1938, was ignored. So we need to get some perspective, some historical perspective. If we don't stand back and look at the bigger picture, we will not understand where we are or how we can get out of the mess that we are in. The contents of the message tell us that the consecration of Russia will stop all war all war. Now that's been predicted in sacred scripture. It's been predicted by Isaiah, by Micaeus, in the Old Testament. That a time will come when they will learn the art of war no more. I have taught in a war school here in Italy. I was the English teacher. Every nation has its own school of war. And every nation has been doing this teaching for centuries. Yet the prophecy of Micaeus is not simply that there'll be no war, but that it will not be learned how to conduct war. This, this knowledge will not be passed on to the next generation. We are in a sea change, an epical sea change. We are on the edge of this. A period of peace will be given to mankind. They will, make, they will learn the art of war no more. They will turn their swords into plowshares. Of course, that's the terminology used by Isaiah. They didn't have words for missiles and, and, um, and um, artillery and things like that. But they will turn their instruments of warfare into instruments of feeding the population. The economic crisis, which I have read, I read the economic press and the counter press. I have taken five years of economics and I suppose I, I, some places like that, they tell you more truth about what's going on in the world because they depend on their subscribers to keep them in business. And if they're wrong, if these economic presses are wrong, they lose credibility and they will stay, go out of business. Many of these people writing this economic press are pointing to this year, are pointing to the the fallimento, the bankruptcy of uh, of the the dollar, of the euro, and of all the currencies. They're not just making this up. They don't say this every five or ten years. They're saying it for now because the evidence is in and they don't see how. There's a millionaire who spends lots of money of his own just to warn the people that this is happening. 
when the US dollar goes, not because it's a, the, the best country in the world or the worst, but when it goes, the way the situation is set up, all the currencies will go at the same time. That's how the world financial structure is made. So that's why Fatima is an answer to this. Now, how do I make the connection between the world financial crisis, which will lead to the world economic crisis, which will lead to the famine you see this man in front of his empty plate? How can I make the connection that would be solved? I know that Mr. Dorlando last year and the year before, and possibly this year as well, has pointed out that the financial situation today is the same as what it was before World War I, and that he cannot see any way out of not having World War III just from the financial crisis alone, except that there be a divine intervention. Now, Our Lady promises us that if her requests are granted, there will be peace. We, of course, can't have peace if everyone's fighting with each other to get a, a plate of food or fighting with each other to get some other necessity. We can have this peace if we do what she asks. We cannot have this peace if we don't do what she asks. Our Lady made it very clear, without that consecration, Russia cannot convert. Without that consecration, the world cannot have peace. So here we have something that has been predicted. The apparitions of Fatima, by the way, have been predicted, as one of the speakers earlier this week pointed out, in 1465, that Our Lady would come at a town in Portugal called Fatima. The event of Fatima is so unique that God has told us of its event 500 years ago. The event has been foretold actually in sacred scripture in the first days of recorded history when God tells the serpent that the woman will crush his head and he will lie in wait for her heel. This triumph of the Blessed Virgin that she has predicted at Fatima has been foretold 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. Fatima is the fulfillment of sacred scripture in many, many places. That is why I believe that sometime in the future, after the consecration of Russia and the victory of Our Lady, the Pope will define that the appearance of the woman clothed with the sun, that the victory promised in chapter 3, verse 15, is fulfilled and therefore part of the deposit of faith. The Pope has not defined that yet, and he wouldn't until these events take place. That is why I could even stop a professor of theology who said it's a private revelation and said, can you tell me that this is not the fulfillment of sacred scripture? Can you assure me that it is not? He said, no, I can't. Then you can't just call it a private revelation because it may be part of the deposit of faith. But we need to get some perspective on the message of Fatima. We are much too close to it. We're much too busy with what we have to do day by day that we don't see the big picture. The secret itself is mentioned in scripture as well. Sister Lucy tells us if you want to know the secret, read it in the, in the Bible, chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 of the Apocalypse. We not just have Sister Lucy's word for that. When Paul VI went to Fatima, he went to chapter 12, verse 1. I saw a great sign, the woman clothed with the sun. That was what he wrote. That's his encyclical for going to Fatima. Pope John Paul II, on the last time he went to Fatima in the year 2000, he tells us that the message of Fatima is a divine warning to mankind not to follow the dragon who, tore, who dragged down from heaven a third of the stars of heaven. He's clearly telling us that this secret is warning us against bad clergy. That is in the secret and that time is now. St. John Eudes tells us, for example, that 
In scripture, when Jeremiah, speaking in God's name, says, if you, my people, will turn back to God, to me, then I, God, will send you priests after my own heart. But St. John Eudes elaborates on that and says, but if you, the people, don't do penance and turn back to God, then God will send you pastors who are wolves in sheep's clothing. He said, this is the worst punishment God can send, his bad priests. That's why when Sister Lucy spoke of the secret in 1957, she spoke about the devil waging this war against the Blessed Virgin, and the biggest war is against the clergy to corrupt them so and to get them to leave the priesthood and to get them to corrupt the faith and thereby leaving the faithful without shepherds the more easy for him to reach to take them. These things in scripture are being fulfilled before our eyes. We are like the Pharisees of old who had their own idea of how Christ should be and how God should send the anointed one. When they saw Christ, they didn't recognize him because he didn't fit their paradigm or their model, their mental model. And as a result, they could not disassociate their minds and say, well, that's just our theory. That's just our way of looking at it. Maybe we're wrong. And I think the same thing has happened to most Catholics today is that they cannot make the paradigm shift. They cannot change their model in their mind to what the reality is. That is why we have to start from the miracle. We have to start from the approval of the church. We have to start from there and say, this is true. What is wrong with what I'm seeing that I, I can't understand? I should start revamping my thinking to be in line with what Our Lady taught me. And when you do that, it's not painful. When you do that, things become much clearer. Your model is correct, and therefore you can understand what goes on. I've had people promoting the message of Fatima, one gentleman who spent $1 million of his own to promote a film. And I went to see him in his store, and uh, he was quite angry with me because I wasn't fulfilling his model of what a Catholic priest should do with the message of Fatima. He based himself on an error of the teaching in Fatima when he said that the Blessed Virgin said, Rush will spread her error, singular, no S. I said, no, she didn't say Rush will spread her error, Rush will spread her errors. He had constructed his whole thinking on a falsehood. That is why when I'm challenged, which I don't mind being challenged, I carry with me the documents. I carry with me a library that cannot fit on this podium because the truth is the most important thing. And the truth of Fatima is the most important thing for a guide for our age. I went, I said, let us, you have the memoirs of Sister Lucy here, let us look at it together. We looked at it and we went to the apparition of July 13th where Our Lady said these words in the third and the fourth memoir both. And of course, it's very plainly there, Rush will spread her errors. He thought that since the fall of communism in 1989, this was the victory of Our Lady because communism was the error, error was overthrown, and therefore Our Lady had her victory. Completely wrong. Unfortunately, there are people who are not willing to be scholarly enough to really understand the message or to think about it. I, I saw some gentleman, some, some priest rather on, on television um, not mentioning me by name, but somehow thinking that he knew more about this and that we were completely wrong, as Mrs. Solchi thought we were completely wrong. The difference with this priest and Mr. Solchi is he actually read our material and realized that we were right. Why do we have books? Because there's so many falsehoods and false interpretations and false models in our mind that we need to actually replace them with true models, with more accurate picture. That is why I, I urge you to read Russian Sunrise. It's a nice story, but I don't urge you to read it for the story of it. But in this form of a story, it describes to you a different model than most, if not all of you, are used to. It describes to you a model of government, 
describes to you a model of finance and of currency. And when people ask why Russia, this author has explained why Russia it needs to be a country big enough to be able to carry out this change in our concepts. Right now, everyone thinks, I believe the Pope the same way, that somehow or other we have no choice but to go along with the new world order, that there's nothing else, there's no alternatives. If that were the case, then God has abandoned us. But God has a, another alternative. And again, it's described, and in, in fact, he describes how the new world order crowd will react to Russia when it's consecrated. He puts it very well. Yes, it's a story, but the lessons are based on good principles and are based on the proper paradigm or the proper model for your head to understand these things. Fatima is historically unique because we are living the scriptural times. Not only from chapter 3, verse 15, I'll put enmities between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head. The devil will be defeated. Our Lady will triumph. The word triumph is the word that she uses at Fatima. In the Apocalypse, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, They shall turn their swords into plowshares, and their spears into, into sickles. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they be exercised any more to war. Any more. In 6,000 years of recorded history, we've had 14,400 wars. That will stop. Not one less war, zero wars for a long time. If we can get our minds around this concept that we are living in particularly dangerous times, but also particularly merciful times of God, we could bring about a great triumph without having to go through all the disasters that are facing us and becoming more and more evident. The third secret is about the church and it's about the state, that is more exactly temporal affairs. In the third secret, it talks about geopolitical affairs which will be most astonishing to everybody. I would urge you to read Father Kramer's book in which he describes the geopolitical events that will take place in the next few years, if not sooner. Events that are unimaginable, but yet the seeds of these events are well planted and prepared. So we have Fatima being unique because we are in a historical time which is unique, and we have the Fatima event being predicted 500 years ago. We have again Mother Mary Mariana de Jesus in, from Ecuador describing our times, the 20th century, and that the most of the faithful will be in error, and that the Masonic sects will be ruling the world. The, the paradigm that's being offered to us is we must stop insisting upon the uniqueness of the Catholic faith, because you see, according to the Masons, all warfare is based on religion. What the Masons don't tell you, first of all, is that they themselves are a religion. They are a satanic religion. They follow the Canaanite gods of the Old Testament. Secondly, they don't tell you that they want to set up their own Masonic rule, enforcing their satanic religion on everybody in the world. The nature of religion in itself is to give honor and glory to God. As St. Thomas points out, every man, woman, and child acts for a, an immediate purpose and a final purpose at the same time. 
If I eat, if I drink, if I talk, I have a purpose, an immediate purpose for why I do those things. But besides that immediate purpose, I also have a final purpose, which is to give honor and glory to God. So ultimately, if I'm not serving the true God, then I'll be serving the false God. And that's why religion can be, ba can be blamed by these, shall we say, shallow people for wars, but it's really because they're serving false gods. And that we have the right to defend ourselves. And if we are attacked, we have a right to defend ourselves even with physical force. But it's not religion that causes, true religion that causes war. It is the, the devil and his followers who cause war. But because they're not thinking this thing through, we, it's just like we have so-called hate crimes. A hate crime is, well, if you, if you struck this other person because he's a homosexual or because he's a Jew or whatever, then it's a hate crime. But really, it's a stupid thing. If we, if we don't hate evil, I'm not talking about the person, but I'm talking about the evil. If we don't hate evil, then we don't love good. The very nature of hatred is to hate the evil that is against the good. So we should hate evil and we should not be punished for hating evil. But yes, we have to respect even those who disagree with us. We have to respect their person, but we don't have to respect their evil. I'm not saying everyone who's in error is maliciously evil, but nevertheless, their error is evil and that error must be opposed and hated. But because, again, people learn things now from the television and from a sound bite of 10 seconds on the radio instead of reading books, this passes for thinking among even the learned today. Again, if we would go back to read the story of Fatima and reflect upon Our Lady's words and re-educate ourselves, we would see that we have taken on the paradigms of the Masons for our day. So when various theologians said that the Second Vatican Council was, was the October Revolution, as I think it was mentioned by, by Cardinal Sunins, or others said it was the French Revolution, not 1789 is the year of the French Revolution. But both of these revolutions are the victories of masonry over Christianity. We need to change our paradigms. We need to change our way of thinking. And we've been formed by the Masonic literature, television, movies, and everything else. And we have excluded the idea that there can be a Christendom, that the whole world would be under Christ the King, that all nations would be Catholic. And yet that is what we are promised at Fatima. I envision on Judgment Day, someone might excuse themselves in saying, Lord, I did this because I had to go along with everybody else. I gave in to religious indifferentism because we were told that by our leaders. We, there was no other way of doing it. Well, the answer, of course, would be, I gave you the, answer, the alternative. I gave you the message of Fatima. I gave you the alternative. You had my word that it would work and you refused to listen. You have no excuse. It's important, I think, for us then to think about Fatima as unique, because it is unique. There are people who promote Medjugorje, which is not approved by the church, and they claim that it's a continuation of Fatima. There's no continuation of Fatima, but Fatima itself. This, these words that Medjugorje is a continuation of Fatima apparently is even in the uh, messages given in Medjugorje. But it is only at Fatima that the world is promised peace. It's only at Fatima that the condition for world peace is laid down. It's only at Fatima. I don't mean always, as the message of Fatima tells us, that war is a punishment for sin. And no doubt someone else can repeat that. But more than just war is a punishment for sin, Our Lady promises us peace if the Pope and the bishops will do this consecration. She promises peace no other place unless it's repeating what she said at Fatima. So Fatima is unique. It should not be substituted by some other apparition 
or anything else. Fatima also warned us about dogma being lost. Again, I am judged by my fellow Catholics sometimes for insisting upon things, but they're telling me, well, you should be obedient, you should be respectful, and I should be obedient and respectful. I pray for all that every day. As far as I know, I've never been disobedient, I've never been disrespectful, although I can't say that as much as I know I've not been disobedient. But there is a higher hierarchy of values, there's a hierarchy of truth. And that hierarchy is that we must believe God before we believe man. And we must believe dogma before we believe the latest theological fashion. Dogma is what God has given us, the solemn definitions of the faith, all of them, not just one or two of them, the solemn definitions of the faith, which we must adhere to to save our souls. And yet dogma has been overlooked and in the name of that Fatima is part, not part of the faith, therefore it can be ignored. On the contrary, it cannot be ignored. And the same people who tell us this are the ones who are changing the faith against the dogmatic definitions. The highest value, and in fact, when we mentioned that Medjugorje is in part wrong, is because, very simple rule, it contradicts defined dogma that outside the church there's no salvation. It has not been defined once, but three different times. That definition cannot be changed. The truth of that definition cannot be changed. And so the two choices that were offered here is one is make no difference what religion you belong to. And yes, you personally can say your prayers at home as long as you don't insist that this is the one true religion. And that's the Masonic plan. As the Masons say of themselves, we don't care if you're Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Hindu. If that's your first name, the last name is Mason. Catholic Mason, Protestant Mason, Jewish Mason, Hindu Mason. Of course, a Catholic Mason is a contradiction in terms. You cannot be a Catholic and a Mason at the same time. By the very fact that you've put, given your adherence to another religion, you're no longer Catholic. What is it that gets us to heaven is our Catholic faith and our baptism. He who wishes to be saved must hold on to the Catholic truth, Catholic faith, whole and entire. That's the creed of the Saint Athanasius. And we're told at Fatima in the secret, the beginning words of the secret, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, meaning that other places it won't be preserved. And Cardinal, uh, both Cardinal Ratzinger and Pope John Paul II have spoken about the apostasy which brings us back to what, for example, Cardinal Bertoni's idea was that the Blessed Virgin wouldn't warn us against false pastors, but yet John Paul II says she would. John Paul II said, can the mother who fosters love for all her children in the Holy Spirit and desires their salvation, can, they re can she remain silent when she sees the very basis, the very foundation of her children's salvation undermined. And Pope John Paul says, no, she cannot remain silent. So more importantly than apparent or political unity is holding on to the faith. And therefore, because that is the basis, one of the basis of our salvation. And if someone is undermining that faith, and that someone be a bishop, a priest, a clergyman, even a cardinal, Our Lady would denounce that because she loves us, because she wants us to save our souls. And so Fatima is unique also in the controversial part of this message. It's not controversial because it's not true. It's controversial because some people have to start rethinking fundamentally what their true loyalties are and what are the foundational principles that everything else has to be judged by. And Fatima is that light for the people of our generation. Unfortunately, for most of them, they are ignoring it. They're not necessarily doing it with bad will. 
They're just not giving it enough attention. But whether they ignore it from bad will or from not giving enough attention, the effect is the same. They're being misled. In the faith, they're being misled. And they're, tomorrow they're going to ask for more taxes, as they've done already in this country. We have to pay more taxes. Instead of believing their governors, believe Our Lady. Instead of paying more taxes, get the Pope to do the consecration of Russia. Then you'll have less taxes by far, not more. The servile state, the state of slavery, which is brought about by the lack of economic freedom. We pretend to think we have great freedom because we can go to a ballot box and put a, a piece of paper in there and say, I want candidate X or candidate Y. All the meantime, we are being taxed into slavery. I remember being uh, on a pilgrimage to St. John, the, the Fort of St. John, not far from Naples, where St. Thomas Aquinas was imprisoned by his family. And two pilgrims were talking about they're much happier to be living today than in the time of the serfs in the Middle Ages. And I just asked them a very simple question. Tax day in the United States is sometime in May. That is five months, and that's just what they know, not counting all the indirect taxation. Five months out of the year, they're working full time for the government. The serfs had 180 days off in holidays and whatever they paid in taxes to their lords was done by March. We are more serfs than the serfs were in the Middle Ages. And yet, of course, we read our newspapers and say how better off we are. The same thing with, with the families. In the 19th century, people could have numerous families. Today, we don't. Today, the priests look the other way while they contraception mentality is taught everywhere. And the answer is, well, we can't do any better because we haven't got the money, so we ha have to limit the number of children in our families. That is, again, because we're being made slaves. Again, because we haven't listened to Our Lady of Fatima. This sin of contraception on the, on the wide scale is what brings about the disaster which is about to befall us all. Instead, if we turned to God, as it says in Scripture, then God would send us pastors after his own heart, and we would be unshackled from our chains, our economic chains that everyone accepts every day, again because they have a paradigm, a model in their minds, which is not God's model for how this is supposed to work. All of these problems will be solved. It's hard to believe if you've not thought about it, it's hard to conceive if you've not taken sufficient historical perspective on Fatima and where it fits in the economy of salvation, where it fits in our lives every day. But all of this will be solved, all of it. Whether it's war, famine, even the limiting of our families because of economic reasons will be stopped. But people have to trust God Trust Our Lady, they have to do what she asks. As I was just talking to a priest here from Rome in this room a few minutes ago, I pointed out that the Roman people have a very special role to play. More exactly, this Roman priest told me the same thing. That they understand more that we have a right and even a duty to ask the Pope for the consecration. It is defined by the Second Council of Lyon, as defined also by the First Vatican Council, that in ecclesiastical matters, the faith will have a right to appeal directly to the Pope. Second Vatican Council in chapter 37 of Lumen Gentium tells us that we have a right to approach our pastors and sometimes even the duty in things that pertain to the common good of the church. This certainly pertains to that because the longer we put this off, the more the loss of dogma goes on, the more souls are lost. And as a result, uh, we become more and more enslaved even physically. Fatima is indeed unique. Fatima is from God. 
and we have such signs and such um, such evidence that it would be truly foolish without disrespecting the person. All the same, it would still be foolish to not take Fatima seriously. And yet that is what is proposed by so-called serious men to this day. We need to not follow these people. It may cost us not only our lives, but our souls. Because as St. Thomas, rather St. Paul tells us in sacred scripture, do not extinguish the spirit, do not despise prophecy, but test all things and hold fast to that which is good. Fatima has been found good. It's been tested and tested and tested. Every Pope since Pius XI has endorsed Fatima. Even Benedict XV, before it was endorsed, was promoting Fatima, even before the, the Bishop of Fatima uh, fully endorsed it. Every Pope since 1930 has told us to pay attention to Fatima. And Pope John Paul II has told us, Fatima imposes an obligation on the church. Apparently, this obligation is not sufficiently understood because although, well, they point out the needs for prayer and the rosary, they don't point it out enough, but all the prophetic message, part of the Fatima message, is pretty well ignored. That is why we need to examine it, embrace it, and pass it on to everyone we can. God bless you. Pray, pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell because they have no one to make sacrifices and pray for them. <laughs>